Okay, so hey everybody, welcome to Chew Stream. Hope you guys are doing great. Uh, today I am going to do some live painting for you guys, so you can also feel free to ask me painting questions and stuff like that. Or if I'm doing something where you're like, "How the heck did you do that?" Then you can. This is the stream to be on, you know, because then you can ask. Okay, so. Uh, I am also here with uh, my wonderful sidekick, Masei Seki. Hey guys! Cool, yeah, so um, just got back from Montreal. Uh, for those of you in France, usually at this time of the year, uh, Ken and I are in Angoulême, France, or just coming back from Angoulême, France, I should say. Uh, this year we couldn't make it. Why? Well, number one was the Montreal workshop, uh, the, the schoolism house. We were not the Montreal workshop, but the schoolism house, the in-house 30-day workshop where you are living with your mentor in uh, Saint Julien, Quebec, Canada, with just three other artists. So there's only four artists accepted at one time, and it was amazing. It was such a wonderful. Uh, experience for me as well as the students um, you know because it's just the four of you and you're living with your mentor and then towards the end of your stay uh, we fly in a guest artist this time a bunch of us came sometimes that happens you never know right so the guest artist was Justin Gobi Fields which he is amazing in case you don't know the kind of things that he's done um, character design, creature design on uh, Rise of the Planet of the Apes. Um, what else? Uh, there's so many. Jupiter Ascending, even though that wasn't like my all-time favorite movie in the world, uh, visually, it was definitely stunning enough for me to want to go see it. So um, that was really great. And of course, Kay and I and Masay, we we're all there. We all yeah. went. What was your favorite part, Masay? Um, I'd have to say it was definitely the snowmobiling. Because, um, one, you know, it's like my first time ever. And also, we, well, I was um, riding with T, uh, Thierry, the workshop mentor. And uh, there was two points where we almost tipped over. Once into the <laughs> ditch and once, like, like just rolling over so you know that was definitely an experience and he said that you were you know you said you were scared but he said you were laughing <laughs> it was kind of like a hysterical laugh because i didn't know what was gonna happen are you like an adrenaline junkie deep inside yeah kind of <laughs> you know just to kind of paint the picture here everybody um you know one day masay came in with like bloody knuckles you know, and we're like, what did you do? And she's like, oh, I was uh, kickboxing. It's just like, what? What are you talking about? <laughs> um, one thing that everybody always tends to ask when they watch me do a stream, I guess it's because, you know, in the very beginning, when I was learning digital painting, I wasn't learning it in California, so and there was no internet, so um, I was really just teaching myself. And... Uh, as a result, a lot of the stuff that I end up doing, a lot of the techniques I end up doing now is kind of like, um, I haven't really heard of them from anybody else before. Uh, so one of the big ones is that I use two windows, right? I use two windows to paint and draw. And why is that? That's because I, uh, this makes sense to me in terms of um, how I paint and draw in real life, which let me explain. So as artists, a lot of times what we do is we look up close, we look from far away, and uh, then we look up close and we draw a bit more, and then we look from far away, we draw a bit more. Well, in, in the digital world, that can get a lot harder I'm just drawing a little bunny right now. Uh, that can get a lot harder because, you know, say I want to 
zoom in on the eye or zoom in on the foot. I want to zoom in on the foot there. Oops. If I go like this, it goes chunk, 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 zooms in, and then I got to go down, and I, I, I'm disoriented, right? And a lot of times that messes me up, and then I got to go, um, okay, where am I? Okay, what was my thought on this? What do I do? It's very difficult. So now, if you have the two windows, you can just look into that secondary window uh, all the time to make sure that you know everything's looking good from far away as well as up close um, you know which you can't do in real life which is fantastic you know so you can go and you know as you're painting in the larger window a lot of times I'll catch myself actually looking in the smaller window it's totally fine it works great that way mm -hmm. so this is for the gallery show that Kay and I are going to be doing in Arludique in um, end of May for Disney. So you guys are getting a sneak peek of uh, some ideas that I might do, I might not do, I'm not sure, but you know, this is the process uh, that I'm taking to do my gallery show. I really like the method of um, doing the small window because I think in the end, it's always about the big picture and when Definitely. people see it, the first instant, like the first thing that they see is like that image and what you know the silhouette of it. So I think that like once I learned that from one of your videos, I was like, oh, it's true. Like we all really get caught up in the details and we want to make it like really nice and rendered or like add the small details. But in the end, it's about what pops up. So right I think on. that's like really great. Thanks. I didn't even know that you used the smaller window. Oh yeah, I do thing. it. That's after, great. After I saw, I'm like, oh tried it out tried it out and it's it's actually really great well you know like, what a lot of people they experience better drawings better paintings right away once they start doing this their results are better uh, so that's pretty incredible okay uh, we have a question from Diane um, having trouble getting variable pressure response from my Wacom stylus pen both the width and the flow don't give as uh, give as an exaggerated response as suggested by my brush setting. So oh, um, okay. I'm not sure exactly what this person means, but I think what they mean is, uh, you know, a lot of times you don't actually use the maximum. Uh, you know, if you if you have like shape dynamics on your stuff. See, I'm painting. Oops. So say I'm painting like with a brush this big, if I have shape dynamics on my stuff, it rarely actually gets that big. Like, perhaps that's what you're saying. I'm not too, too sure. Um, definitely sounds like it's in your brush settings. And so perhaps one day I should do a custom brushes uh, video. Um, let me know in the comments if, uh, if that's something that you guys would like to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a lot of people wonder how they how people make their own custom brushes, and <laughs> it's it's hard to kind of I I don't know maybe it's just me, but I don't personally go out of the way to find out. It's nice when someone actually shows you in front of you like step by step. Oh and yeah, it's a lot easier to. Well, you know, this one today it's interactive, right? Today yeah. it's interactive. So why don't I show you guys? Uh, how to make one of my brushes okay so let's take a step back I'm going to uh, just make a blank canvas here All right so first to oh, let me see which brush I'm using so let me show you what the effects of this brush is right it feels textury really textury and it has this kind of almost like a hairy kind of feel to it okay so there's two parts to this the texture comes from the texture library that you select so I'll show you how to do that and um, the brush it, like the actual shape of the stamp is something that I created so 
let's create the stamp. Okay. Oops. Okay, so I'm just gonna actually why don't I use a custom brush to make a custom brush? <laughs> that might be fun. Okay, so either way you can do this with just your default brush. Uh, what you want to do first is you want to actually you want to make the texture and put it into your library. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to open any files because I, I fear showing something that's confidential or something. I don't know. So I'm just going to grab some texture from this actual like uh, cardboard texture that I have here. It's not the best texture, but so after you copy a nice square of texture, perhaps I'll do a bigger square. This is impromptu, so pardon me. Okay, so I'm going to grab a big texture square. I'm going to copy it, and then I'm going to make a new document, right? And automatically it will make a document exactly that size. I'm going to paste, and then I'm going to just merge my layers together. So after this, what we have to do with this texture, and this could be a texture of anything. It could be a texture of a pile of oranges. And then, you know, it doesn't really matter. What you want to do is you want to go to Filter, Other, Offset. Okay, and then you would kind of make sure that it's not dead center. And you want to try to find some seam lines. This would make a lot more sense if, say, the texture was like was like this, right? If there's texture all around, and I want to make this stuff into texture, then I would go to Filter, Other, Offset, and now you can see those those uh, seam lines I was talking about much clearer, right? It doesn't repeat perfectly. In fact, it repeats horribly. So what you want to do from here is you want to grab like something like a stamp tool and you would target by holding down Alt and then you would stamp in, close up those seams, okay? until there are no more seams left and now your texture is repeatable seamlessly. I don't want this texture because it looks really bad. So I'm gonna go with this one, okay? Now the thing to know about the textures is that it works um, in black and white. It works in values, right? So what we wanna do here is we wanna make the values a bit more extreme, I would Think. So I'm going to go to Control L, which is Levels, or Command L if it's in uh, a Mac, and I'm going to bring the textures, heighten these textures a lot, right? The values a lot, so it's much more uh, grainy, or you know, much more textury. I guess would be the proper word. Now it's super saturated. Obviously, I, I was just saying we are not going to absorb any of that kind of saturation there. Um, so I'm just going to turn down all the saturation and this is the texture that we're looking for, right? Once you have a good texture that you that you like and that is repeatable, you can go up to edit, define pattern. Okay, edit, define pattern and you can name your pattern. Now when you press OK, now it's in your texture library. Okay, next part to this is Uh, we got to make our little stamp. So to make our little stamp, actually, why don't I just go with the default, just in case that way everybody can see. Uh, so again, the stamp is very much kind of like a uh, works in black and white or grays actually. So you can do like semi opaque stuff as well. Okay, but you can create whatever shape you want. I like to try to keep it looking a bit more organic. So I try to think about, well, if I had, say, like a camel brush and I just plopped on, just let it touch the page, what kind of, 
you know, mark would it make. So I'm thinking something like that. Once you have something good, then you're going to go to edit. And instead of define pattern, this time you're going to go edit, define brush preset. And now we have the sample brush. And you can see that this number down here, maybe you can't see it, it says 1,171. That's a big brush. I don't want it that big. You know, uh, that means that's going to be 1,171 pixels by 1,171 pixels or something like that. Um, so instead, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, let's grab this, let's transform it, let's make it much smaller. Okay, something more like 400 pixels, something like that. And then I'm going to go to edit, define brush preset. And now you can see it's at 644. So that's like 200 off. But anyways, you can name it, you press OK. And now when I go into my brushes, you can see that it is the exact shape. It is automatically selected that brush. Okay, so let's test it out. The brush looks pretty chunky, pretty bad. And if I lower the opacity, it looks like scales or tire tracks. That's not going to be good. So next part to this is to open up our brushes, our brush options. I'm going to reduce our spacing so it doesn't look like tire tracks. Instead, it's going to be nice and smooth. I'm going to reduce it down to like a four or a five, I guess. That's a little better, kind of like that. OK. Actually, I made it six because the um, the less spacing you have, the more the more computing power your computer is going to need. Okay, so after this, and by the way, if you miss anything, I will be putting this onto uh, my YouTube channel at youtube.com/slash/digitalbobbert. Um, so after this, I'm going to go to Shape Dynamics, right? Before the very first one, I highlighted Brush Tip Shape to change the spacing. Now I'm going to go to Shape Dynamics, make sure that's clicked on. I'm going to turn my pen pressure to control the size. Okay, I'm going to give it, so now I can go smaller or larger, which is great. Still looks pretty bad. Uh, in my opinion. So I'm going to give it a little bit of a size jitter, which means it's going to sporadically change sizes of your brush, which is nice. Now it feels a bit more organic, right? Um, next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to give it an angle jitter. So it will constantly change the angle, which will be really nice. And that's how I got that furry effect, right? You can turn that down if you want, if you don't want too much of that. Um, next thing I'm going to do is uh, let's go to texture, right? And if I go to texture, I click on texture, you can see that the very last one is actually the one that I just saved. Of course, I can't see the texture now, and that can be really annoying. But that's just because the settings on my texture is not set to the right setting. So I think I'm going to go linear burn. That's usually a really good one um, to get the nice textures out. Now you can see that there's this invert and there's texture each tip. Click them on and off to see which combo you're going to like the most. You can see this is like high level texture. I don't know if I want this either because it just kind of looks strange. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, perhaps I could do that and texture each tip. That feels nice. Yeah, it looks good. Yeah, and it's already feeling pretty good. Mm -hmm. Okay, last thing, if you want, you can go to transfer and you can set your opacity to being controlled by pen pressure or flow or just one of them. You know, so I'm going to just make it flow. And that means when I paint lighter, then the paint is going to come out even lighter. And when I press dark, flow is going to increase, which means that the paint is going to come out very quickly, which is nice. You know, when you paint lighter, notice that you see so much more texture. 
just as if you're glazing over top of a textured surface. And when you press darker, it's like you're putting on more paint and all of a sudden less texture comes out. Right? That's pretty cool. I made this up myself. <laughs> Can I be proud for a second? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so that I'm was... I'm going to have to credit you every time I'm like, here's my brush set. <laughs> <laughs> all thanks to Bobby. Well, you don't need to do that. But, um, <laughs> So, oh, before I finish, now that you did, you know, now that I did all these settings and all these changes to the brush, you have to save the brush. This is the most important thing because if you go to another brush and you come back to this brush, it will uh, look like the tire tread kind of brush that we were starting off with. So go down here. There's a little icon here, same icon for like new layer. It's like the universal icon in Photoshop for new whatever. So I'm going to click on that. It's going to ask me to save my brush. And right here it says capture brush preset or brush size in preset. So that means if you go back to this brush, it will always be at 300. Uh, I don't generally like clicking that on because if I'm working with a really small brush and I want to go to this brush, um, I click on it. If this wasn't clicked on, then that means I would, you know, go to this brush, but of a smaller size or whatever size I was using, which uh, I find a bit more helpful. All right, so super long uh, talk. Let's get back to the painting, and I'm gonna try out my texture, my new brush. Super cute. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so we had a couple of questions piling in. Um, Kendra asks, I'm coming to the live workshop in Berlin this year. Yay. Right on. You got in. It's sold out. Oh, yeah. It was quick. And she says, uh, I heard something about parties. So what, where, when, and who? Uh, I think every, every workshop is a little different. I think Berlin, it's going to be impromptu, like... Uh, they'll tell you at the party or at the workshop mm -hmm. um, if there's a get together or something like that there hopefully there should be uh, that's one of my favorite things so time though time would be generally it's usually 8 30 everybody meets and then uh, it ends about uh, 12 30 1 o'clock hopefully sometimes it goes really late and uh, everybody comes in really groggy and sleepy and hungover and everything. Um, so not super recommended to stay up out super late. And that's why we usually start it at 8.30 uh, p.m. Uh, but I'm not exactly sure our event coordinator, uh, T, she will be there and she can definitely answer those questions for you okay so next question is um by diane brush shape shows a sharp tip a uh, sharpish tip but when you use the brush you don't get that sharpish tip shape yes why and how can i get that sharp tip finish on every stroke uh you just gotta reduce the size of your brush because like I said even though it says a certain maximum certain minimum you don't generally get those you know you generally don't get the super sharp tips however if you would like something like that with extreme um, range the the one that I use would be sketchbook pro you can actually control the range you know, so you can have it minimum, the absolute minimum size of a brush, and then the maximum, the absolute maximum size of a brush, which is kind of interesting. That's pretty cool. Um, so the next question is by Sagittarius. Okay, A star. Um, hey, Bobby, I'm starting out in art. Want to go pro. Right I want to ask when I should jump into digital. Should I practice traditionally more at first or just dive in? Uh, you know what? I think the main thing is don't be all scattered brained. You know, best way to learn art is to focus in on one thing and 
learn the heck out of it until you learned it and then move on. Generally, that's also the most boring way to do things, but it is the most effective. So uh, my advice to you is uh, either or, either one, digital or traditional. I tended to go back and forth in the beginning, like I would go through a period where it's all traditional. I just struggle through that, and then I'd go back to digital, and I'd be like, wow, this is kind of cool. But the thing I didn't do was, um, oh, digital today, traditional tomorrow, digital next day, and so on and so forth, or pastels or whatever. Instead, it was more like, okay, three months, all digital, next three months, all traditional. Uh, you can go the other way, but and there are periods of time where I did go the other way, but um, I found that the best results definitely come from more of a isolated, you know, concentration on, on one aspect. You know, it's kind of like working out, right? Like you, you isolate muscles. Mm -hmm. Thinking in different ways is kind of like different muscles. Don't you think like you look at something and then you look at it kind of like, okay, what if this was just 2D generic shapes, yeah. right? And then you look at it that way and then you control your your uh, proportions and all that kind of stuff. I'm gonna make this little rabbit worried. I think Aww. that'd be so cute. <laughs> he's worried he's gonna be late. And he can't tell the time because he's a little bunny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think for me, my method is um, generally I try to draw whenever I can, wherever I am. So obviously oh, I won't good. have like, a, unless I have an iPad, um, I, I'll draw in my sketchbook that I'll carry around. And then whenever I get the chance at home, I'll do digital work. So I think it's good to go back and forth because you can still work on your traditional skills, but it's also good to get hands-on with digital just to get a head, head start. And For sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a great answer. Um, and you know, like I've done the same in the past before, so I can definitely agree to it. Uh, yeah, of course it is easier to concentrate on one thing at a time oh, yeah, or one sure. one material at a time but uh you know nobody's absolutely perfect like in in well not that that's not perfect if you try out a bunch of stuff but mm -hmm. you you know what i mean yeah cool do you like traditional better or digital better i go through i go through periods of time oh, where i'm like, like yeah i totally <laughs> like digital and then all of a sudden, oh, I just want to do traditional stuff because there's something very magical about doing traditional stuff. Yeah, it's like you get to see each person's little touch and their, I don't know, it yeah. kind of shows a bit of, of them through every sh like stroke and every like line. And yeah, there's something about that. Something cool that Craig Mullen said is, okay, if he gives you a brush to use, right? And for those of you that don't know who Craig Mullins is, you guys got to look him up because he is, many people call him the godfather of digital painting. He is the one that spawned us all <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> uh, you know, the first Photoshop digital painter. Uh, and many people consider, you know, one of the, the best, if not the best digital painter. Uh, it, you know, so anyways, he was saying if he gave you a brush, you know, one of his brushes, because that's what a lot of people ask. What kind of brush do you use? What kind of brush do you use? <laughs> uh, if he gave you one of those brushes and you made some marks, you would actually make the same marks as him, mm -hmm. right? Of course, how he puts them together is a different story, but you would be making the same marks as him. However, if he gave you a real brush and asked you to paint something, your brush strokes your brush marks would be different. Totally. Same with a pencil, mm -hmm. right? We all use a pencil. We all use the same kind of pencil generally. You know, it's a pencil, yet all of our drawings tend to look very different. So 
that's the wondrous thing about traditional art. Not only that, but um, another golden nugget, if I can uh, give you guys one that Paul Zane told me, was um, when he would paint traditional a lot more, he was thinking like seven steps ahead, eight steps ahead. He would put down, literally, he'd put down one stroke thinking about the next seven moves he's going to do. Mm -hmm. And with digital, you don't need to do that. Yeah, you can just right. explore, you can erase, you can, you know, you can erase paint till it's perfectly gone, uh, all sorts of things. But um, with traditional, it's like you put down one mark and that's, it's much harder to edit right mm -hmm. yeah that's that, I guess that's a great thing about digital okay uh, the next question is from Monica she asks or she says awesome iPad Pro review makes me want to get one as well it seems to fit my needs but I'm not an Apple fan do you know any alternatives to iPad Pro yeah uh, well the Wacom companion I have I have one K has one um, and then we also, you know, you can explore the, the Surface Pro. Um, I have one, but it's a much older one. So obviously they have much nicer ones now. So I can't really speak about the Surface Pro unless I get one of the new ones. Mm -hmm. Um, but those are some good options and the Surface Pro is much cheaper. So that might be a good alternative. Yeah, I enjoyed the iPad Pro for its like the big screen and just portabil portability. Yeah, you've you've used both. Yeah. Now, which one? Which one do you like better for what? Um, I think on the go and just traveling, the iPad Pro definitely is a big like plus, just because you know you can just pop it in your bag and it doesn't weigh more than the Cintiq. But then the Cintiq it runs like bigger programs like Photoshop so it's really you know it's hard to say it really depends on what you need it for but I do recommend the iPad Pro I love them both you know yeah I was saying in the review and of course you can maybe we'll put a link oh yeah to the review on the YouTube video but uh, I like them both it's like apples and oranges like yeah, They're exactly. Both, both different. Or both apples different. and Wacoms. Um, <laughs> apples and Wacoms, right? Uh, yeah, one I would use if I have a desk, right? I would use the Companion over the Pro, the iPad Pro, if I had a desk. You know, if I'm traveling around or I have to go to other people's uh, studios or something to work or something like that, then I would use the, the Pro. Um, if or sorry the companion if I was you know climbing a mountain and I wanted to sketch at the top of the mountain or something I would be using the, the iPad Pro mm -hmm. that makes sense yeah okay uh, so the next question is uh, hey Bobby I don't want to monopolize but what subjects do you recommend to focus on when starting out fundamentals mm -hmm. Fundamentals. Uh, actually, I would love to ask Masay this question because, mm -hmm. you know, um, I'm a bit older than you, so perhaps you have a much clearer memory of when you were struggling in the very beginning and stuff like that. Yeah, um, definitely the fundamentals, uh, like drawing boxes, perspective, um, Hmm. I guess I'm still getting into color, so I think the fundamentals will definitely come in use. So, so you went black and white first, you, you or you you went lines first? Yeah, I I, I never really like before I went in, went to school. I never really thought of going into art, so I would just do it all on the side and never really finish my drawings or like finish the uh, paintings and stuff. So. Oh, they're just doodles. Yeah, they're mainly just doodles back in like high school. So I think, um, yeah, just starting off the, with the basics um, or even drawing whatever you want to draw with 
a bunch of references is definitely a good idea. Um, just because it's hard, even though you have like this whole picture in your head, it's. I didn't realize that reference is a major part of drawing because you won't actually, people will question like what you draw just because it doesn't look like it. So if you have something to base it off of, it, you'll get like the small details that you need to put down in order to make it look like whatever you're drawing. So I think um, definitely fundamentals and just draw what you would like to draw. I think that's my advice. That's great advice. That's great advice. And uh, I really like how you were saying that you started off just kind of working on lines. Mm -hmm. And I was very much the same way because line, you know, it's a lot easier to understand line. And if you really struggle with it and, you know, learn to get good with it, uh, by the time you go on to, say, lighting, you know, then you'll see all these correlations and everything that you learned with lines will soon come to flourishing when you're learning uh, tones because you'll see like drawing and painting become very similar in the end and the line between drawing and painting really start to blur mm -hmm. and yeah and I, I noticed that after I did a lot of the fundamentals I saw myself improving a lot more so mm -hmm. and totally like the reason is because the fundamentals apply to everything right it umbrellas everything there's light on everything there is shadow on everything there's structure with everything even like water has a certain structure to it um even clouds right and clouds like air come on mm. so fundamentals and if I could suggest a really great, you know, a couple really great classes or books about uh, fundament, like structure fundamentals, uh, I really love Bridgman stuff. If you look up uh, uh, Bridgman artist, you'll find all these wonderful, and I guess most of them might be out of print, I don't know. But that's, that was one of my favorite artists when I was learning structure. Uh, a little kind of caveat to that. Yesterday, so yesterday I was talking with Craig Mullins, right? And we were going over his new class uh, portfolio review with Craig Mullins. Holy smokes. <laughs> so I had to take the opportunity and I was like, you know, why don't we run through it first? with me with my own portfolio and then you can like you know look at it and review it just like as if you were reviewing a uh, one of your students and he said to me um, yeah he like he did it and everything was great and he was saying that recently he's just been drawing he's just been drawing not even painting mm -hmm. which I thought was really interesting and he was saying that um, He's been studying different, he was, he's been studying anatomy, but not just anatomy, but how different artists draw the same muscle. Mm -hmm. He doesn't stop at one, you know? He literally will explore how various, various artists all draw the same muscles mm -hmm. and how do they do it in their own different ways. And once you have a bunch of different ways under your belt, then that opens up the possibilities for um, creating your own way. I thought that was really powerful, you know, when he told me that. Because, yeah, a lot of people, we just, we do that. We do the thing where, you know, we, um, we study so-and-so, it's working, and then we just stop searching for other ways. It's crazy to think that like Craig Mullins, he's mm. still like still studying. studying. Yeah, <laughs> he's literally he told me literally drawing over a thousand drawings. You know, in the past little while, he's been drawing over a thousand drawings that are not for anybody except for himself. Mm -hmm. 
and he is like the masters of masters kind of thing so hey if you feel like oh i've passed the fundamentals think again because those are something that's something that uh you cannot really complete you know you cannot you can never truly master mm -hmm. let's draw one more quick one okay so let's just we move on to the next question. Um, I, Jerome says, I've been proposed to give free Skype talks for Indian students. I want to do it, but I don't have so much years of experience. Any tips how I could manage this? Oh, um, just do it. You know, just do it trial, trial by fire. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's the best way. And, and uh, something that might help you is you know, look to interviews and talks and stuff like that that you liked. You know, perhaps Steve Jobs or I don't know who. But um, I love, you know, it's like a lot of things that helped me over the years were just things that I just loved anyways. And I would just do it anyways. So, like, I love listening to interviews. I love listening to interviews, but also just concentrating on how they interview. You know, their mannerisms, their timing, how they uh, frame a question, stuff like that. I thought it was very, it's very interesting and, and you can really uh, learn a lot from it. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure they would really appreciate just any sort of talk as well. Yeah, you know, they don't know nothing. <laughs> They're just <laughs> students at the time. You can tell them whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but of course don't because that's like one of the big problems with schools nowadays is that teachers not every teacher but the bad ones will just kind of pretend that they know and it's okay if you don't know everything you know a lot of times when I was teaching at like Sheridan College uh, back in the day I was teaching the graduating students you know so it's like they know a lot already so I wouldn't, you know, if they asked me something I didn't know, I'd say I don't, I don't know it, but I'll, I'll find out, you know, and get back to them. And I feel like that is the much better way to go. Um, it also encourages students to kind of chime in if they do know. And, uh, you know, with that, it helps to strengthen the belief in themselves and stuff like that. It's healthy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the next question is from Diane. Um, if you incorporate stock photos into an illustration, do you have to up-res the photo to match the illustration before adding to the picture? Ooh, up-res, that's a nasty word. I hope that doesn't mean enlarge it um, yeah. because that's not going to be good. Uh, I don't really use photos very much at all. Actually, very, very rare. Uh, would I use it in a painting? Perhaps later on, you know, it could be just a phase right now. But um, I would say you got to find a bigger texture if you feel like you need to up res it. You know, up resing it doesn't mean up resing it, it just means like making it fuzzy and bigger. Mm -hmm. Do you use photos in your stuff, you say? Not too much, no, right? not too much. Yeah. If anything, I'll try to draw it. Mm. And that's also like a learning experience too. Yeah, like this texture that I use, that I'm using to paint or to do my little ideas on top of, um, this was a, this was this size, you know, so it's okay. Mm -hmm. I think it's also good to just put it into the Photoshop drawing, lower the opacity and if you want, you can also like trace over it just to use it as reference. Okay. Um, so from Diane, did Kay have any problems using the tablet during snowmobiling, such as too slow because of the cold? How did the battery hold up? Did she have to adjust brightness after coming home? Um, well, snowmobiling, we didn't actually sketch while snowmobiling because that would be crazy and mm -hmm. I would be super scared of like <laughs> dropping it yeah, and then yeah because we were really going fast 
and uh like and we didn't know what we were doing yeah 90 kilometers with bumps yeah so perhaps uh yeah in freezing cold temperatures <laughs> perhaps if well for the our american friends out there that's like probably like 50 yeah. going 50 miles an hour kind of thing um when there's wind right then there's like wind chill and we didn't use the ipad pro but we did use our phones to try to capture you know and film some stuff mm -hmm. and i i found that my phone started to turn off because mm -hmm. it's so cold mm -hmm. um you're on an android did yours turn off at all or no mine lasted the whole trip <laughs> <laughs> i think i think the phones but the son of a gun <laughs> but the ipad when Kay was drawing the the husky she, it seemed like she was doing fine in the it wasn't lagging because of the cold. Right, right. And I did about an hour of sketching outside as well with no wind, but it was in freezing temperatures and it was totally fine. Mm -hmm. That was pretty cool. Um, Monica asked, do you think Kay would be up to do any streams or interview with Schoolism slash you? You know what? I've asked her, and actually I asked her this morning. Um, in the future. Yeah. In you want to speak up? You can hear that, everybody. <laughs> she said, "In the future, future. in the future." Okay. When in the future? We caught that on I don't recording. Know. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You're gonna have to now. I actually I asked her if she would um, do the sketching today, but she's doing a lot of work, so yeah. she couldn't. Busy, busy. But yeah, I'm on it. You know what? It's funny because a lot of people ask me. <laughs> hey, why not? Um, a lot of people ask me, but she just doesn't want to. She's so it's busy. So eventually, I think we will. Yes, <laughs> I don't take no for an answer. <laughs> I just hear not right now, and I'll come back later and ask you again. <laughs> Looking forward to that. Okay, uh, Adrian asks, have you ever tried to recruit Marco uh, Derjevic? Yeah, Kim Jong-gi or Adi Granov for Schoolism? Or interview them maybe? Oh, yeah. You know, um, I totally should. Uh, Marco is awesome. Love that guy. He's amazing. And he's, a, and he's a super funny guy too. So, yeah, I've met him a few times and every time has been a very pleasant experience um, that's a great suggestion I'm gonna definitely follow mm -hmm. up on that the other person was Kim jong -gi? yes oh, the, master, the master the living master like uh, everybody kind of agrees that this guy is phenomenal Insane. so <laughs> yes I would love to do that I should do that and I will reach out to him as well uh, the last one was the Addy Grenov. Um, you know what? This is why you don't you don't snub people at conventions and stuff because he didn't know who I was. I went up, I approached him, I talked with him, and he totally snubbed me. <laughs> he probably has no idea or whatever. So I have no inclination to interview him. Mm. Uh, at this point of course I don't know how his day was that day maybe he's he's a very warm you know welcoming person and uh, that day was just a bad day yeah maybe he's trying another time yeah so perhaps I should perhaps mm -hmm. I should uh, <laughs> yeah like uh, you know what I will try that one as well oh yeah that'd be pretty cool Okay, um, Katie asks, are you guys able to upload the stream you did with Nathan, please? And, yeah, we will, I think, this yes. week. Yes, uh, that one should be coming up next, perhaps, or yeah. the one after. I'm not too, too certain, but, mm -hmm. um, because I do want to finish the video from Montreal. Yeah, that'll uh, come up. But yeah, Nathan's demo was pretty great. Mm hmm and that's the best thing about catching the live streams right because you guys get to watch this like 
a week or two weeks or a few weeks before everybody else uh, on YouTube. Okay, um, Oliver asks, I'm interested in concept art in Ontario. I'm an illustrator, but I want to improve my digital skills. Do you know some schools that are not online? Um, Peter Chan, my buddy Peter Chan, and also uh, Imagine, Imaginism, uh, part of the Imaginism family, he literally teaches all of Toronto almost, right? Like, he mm -hmm. teaches at OCAD, Sheridan, Seneca, I think Humber he, or Centennial or one of those. And, he uh, went to Algonquin once, right? Even Algonquin, yeah. yeah. So he does live tutoring stuff, I think. I'm not absolutely sure, but it's Peter Chan, the artist in Toronto, <laughs> because there's probably like 10 billion Peter Chans out there, uh, even though there's probably like less than 9 billion <laughs> in people in the world. Uh, somehow, somehow I'm just going to go with that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so search out, I would search out Peter Chan. Mm -hmm. He's an absolute great artist. He's a great teacher. Like a lot of the students that he has, it's just wonderful. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, another, another great example of somebody that actually likes to teach, wants to teach, and has many options. You know, it doesn't have to teach. Those are generally the best teachers. Um, of course, generally, those teachers are always busy because they're working and they're doing cool stuff, mm -hmm. which he also does. Um, but, you know, that's part of the reason why we do these schoolism workshops as well, so that we can bring these teachers out of the woodwork into incredible places like uh, Berlin or London things like that and uh, on that same note I want to announce that we are coming to Stockholm again and the tickets for Stockholm that was sold out last year are on sale now on schoolism.com okay and for the for YouTube we'll put a, um, a link Mm -hmm. I'll be there, which I'm super excited for. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. It's a really good lineup. Great I lineup. know. Shiung Kim's going to be there. Um, Shiung Kim's going to be there. Steven Silver's going to be there. Daniel Ariega. So those are three character designers, right? And they're all going to be on the same day. So y if you are even remotely interested in character design... That is the ultimate uh, workshop for you. And then we have my buddy Eric Canetti. Uh, who else is there? Sam There's Nielsen. Sam Nielsen. And Chris Pern. And Chris Pern. Yeah, yeah and they're going to be doing uh, story, you know, illustrations about story, you know, that, that are, or how to bring story into your illustrations with Eric Canetti. You have. Um, Sam Nielsen talking about the lighting to to support story and uh, of course Chris Pern story artist and director he's gonna be talking about just story itself you know which is gonna mm -hmm. be phenomenal phenomenal and just to give you an idea of the caliber of uh, you know work that he does um, I believe he's working on the one of the next like Star Wars family kind of uh, films, the spin-off Han Solo, which is highly anticipated and will be really highly anticipated once commercials and stuff come out. So yeah, definitely check out that workshop. That's going to be really great. Yeah, looking so forward to that. Now, have you been to? Um, Stockholm? Stockholm before? No, this is my first time. I've never been to Europe, so well, nice. I'm excited. <laughs> well, yeah, so you guys will meet uh, Masei Seki there as well. Yeah, I hope to see everyone there. And, uh, oh, I don't sorry. think I'm going to be there. Yeah, I'm going to be in Paris. Paris. 
So you can, if you can come to Paris, we're going to be doing a gallery show, a uh, Disney gallery show for Alice Through Looking Glass. I believe that will be uh, May 27th, I believe. I'm not mm -hmm. absolutely certain, but it will be in May. So that's mm -hmm. going to be awesome too. Hey, there's Noah on the stream. Huh? Oh, Noah's on the stream. what's up, Noah? So Noah, our wonderful friend Noah, uh, she is from Israel and stayed at the house for the 30-day workshop um, in Saint Julien, just outside of Montreal, Canada. And uh, yeah, we went over there, stayed with all of them for. So five days mm -hmm. felt like two days yeah it went by so fast too fast <laughs> and well, her cooking is great yes Noah. yes oh my gosh <laughs> we miss your cooking noah and you <laughs> yeah. right okay. on. so the next question is um Hey Bobby, everyone asks, always asks the best advice you have ever got. What's the worst advice you have ever got? Oh, um, worst advice I ever got. That's a really good one. Uh, don't start a studio straight <laughs> out of school. You know, do about 10 to 20 years at somebody else's studio before you start your own studio. How insane is that? I'll tell you why that's so insane. Not only is it wasting a, you know, I I still wouldn't have started a studio yet, or maybe by now I would have, you know, just started to think about it. First of all, say you're out of school, you're 22, 23, 24, or something like that, and then you work for 20 years. Now you are 44. Okay. Do you have family? Do you have kids? Do you have responsibilities? You're much less flexible, right? Wouldn't it become even harder? Perhaps, yeah. Not only that, but like, okay, you're working in a studio. Well, and you might know some stuff working in a studio um, about how people do things. But the art industry changes like every five years there's a pretty noticeable difference in how people do things so you stay at a studio for 10 years all that stuff that you learned in the first half is pretty much not even necessary you know, not applicable mm -hmm. you know you learn which peg bars to buy for your animation <laughs> yeah. you know, it's like well nobody uses peg bars anymore um, stuff like that right so that's number one number two is uh, when you're just coming out of school are you okay with eating ramen every day and instant noodles every day and uh, you know totally grinding it out and and totally focused on building up your studio yeah most of you I would say yes you know because it's just you very flexible at this time um, yeah so that was definitely one of the worst I'll tell you some that I've heard from other students that tell me oh this is what my teacher said so one of the worst was the person said oh my teacher said don't become don't go after character design in, a, in film because there's too many people trying to get that and uh, you know the chance of you getting it are too little it's like are you serious oh that's the worst advice you know like I can ever get okay yeah maybe I'll go after becoming like a you know like what like some I don't even know you know <laughs> like you're just downplaying yeah. you're just lowering your expectations mm -hmm. and it's like you're failing before you even started or you, you're not even starting it so mm -hmm. well think about this if you asked um, a struggling musician uh, or 
more like a failed musician or something like that, or a musician that ends up um, not by choice, but because of circumstance, has to you know do uh, music on the in a restaurant or side of the street or whatever, and it wasn't their dream to do that. If you ask them, hey, uh, I want to be an artist, I want to be a musician, what kind of advice do you think that person would say if you want to be this rock star, you know, concert filling musician, right? What would that person say? You'd probably say, oh, that's really hard. You know, don't do that. Yeah. Don't go for that. But then if you ask like Beyonce and you said, hey, I really want to be a musician. You know, I want to be just like you when I grow up or whatever. What do you think she'll say? She'll be like, yeah, sure, you could do that. Right? It's totally possible. Mm -hmm. So that's the other messed up thing about art. When um, you're in a situation with teachers that teaching is not their ultimate goal. Teaching was never their ultimate goal. Right? Perhaps they don't even like teaching, but that's all they can do. Uh, or they probably can't even do that, but they got a job doing that. <laughs> They're probably not going to give you the best advice, you know, career advice. Why the heck? You know, it's like people that didn't reach their goals, they would have something to probably offer, but not as much to offer advice wise than, say, um, you know, a person that succeeded in what they wanted to do and it's doing exactly what they wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Which is one of the wonderful things about the workshop house is just like the stories, you know, at dinner time and stuff like that, hearing Justin's stories. You know, Justin Gobi Fields, he is working on so many of like the big movies that everybody wants to work on now. But four years ago, he was a pizza delivery person. That's crazy. <laughs> right? Now, imagine you asked him, hey, how, you know, I really, really want to be a concept artist or whatever. Um, I really need to get there in four years. Do you think he'll tell you, oh, it's impossible? No. But say you, you know, talk to somebody that's been trying for like 50 years and still nothing. Would that person say, oh, yeah, that's kind of impossible? A lot more chance, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's huge out. things to think about, yeah. no? And the funny thing is, is like, well, teachers do they get paid more than people that um, work like on big, big projects like Avatar or something like mm -hmm. that? Most likely not. Most mm -hmm. likely not even close. Mm -hmm. Not even, not even in the same ballpark. Uh, how is that going to help education right. if it's kind of set up that way mm -hmm. so that people have to, you know, want to take a huge pay cut? Not only that, but the way that um, a lot of schools are structured is like you have to take this class. You have to take that class. You have to take these compulsory classes. Um, as a teacher, I could definitely tell you while I was, you know, teaching in college, in a great college, uh, even if I have one student that doesn't want to be there, it affects me tremendously. You know, that person that's just perhaps on their phone or, you know, not paying attention, talking with their friends, uh, while you are trying to really, you know, teach. Now, I could stay there and take it, you know, or I can work on cool movies. Which one would you rather have? Mm -hmm. That's why, you know, with uh, schoolism, it's been really great because twofold. One is the teachers make really good money, like substantial money where uh, it's more than their, than, you know, pretty much all of everybody's um, fees when they are working in film so that's really good that's gonna make people want to teach and the best teachers want to teach mm -hmm. and the other side of it is that you aren't paying tens of thousands of dollars 
to attend school. Yeah. You're actually, you know, paying like ten dollars, twelve dollars a month, right? And that can't even buy you supplies at school.、Uh, you know, we are trying to change things here. We are, we want to affect the world, and to do so, education, the best education, needs to be completely affordable, where you don't even think about it. And、it's really all about your determination that、uh, will determine your success.、Mm-hmm, definitely. It's starting. We're doing it. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay.、Um, Batman says, "Hey guys,、uh, where will there be any future workshops in the U.S.? Hopefully on the East Coast, New York, Philly. That would be great if you guys could make it down here." Yeah. So New York, I would love to do that one. Philly. That sounds really promising as well.、Mm-hmm. Um, but if anything, it would probably be New York first.、Uh, let me give you a rundown of the workshops that are happening now. So Stockholm, I was saying May,、uh, end of May. Steven Silver, Daniel Arega, Shiyun Kim, Chris Pern, Sam Nielsen, Eric Canetti, and then、um, the next one coming up is actually Montreal. Montreal, March twelfth, thirteenth. That's going to have Daniel Ariega, who is, if you don't know, you know Daniel Ariega. He's an art director at a studio called Pixar for character design. And what he's going to teach in Montreal is character design. You know, so if you want to get in the industry, you got to search these people out. I can't do much more than to bring them into your hometown. <laughs> if you miss、yeah. out, you're going to regret it. I think. Hopefully not, but、uh, most likely, yeah, you're gonna regret it. N- but besides Daniel Arega, there is Chris Pern, director, story artist Chris Pern, Luis Gonzalez, who's worked on every single Brad Bird movie as a story artist. That is a hot ticket. Plus Luke de Marchier, who is a veteran in、uh, the world of. Animated films. Nathan Falks, another veteran, one of my artistic heroes, and、uh, one of my best buds, Mr. Steven Silver. They're all going to be in Montreal. And then Florence, March nineteenth. K and I, we're going to Florence with、uh, Helen Mingju Chen, Ryan Lang. Seattle is happening after that, April seventh and eighth, with Marcelo Vignali, one of my other artistic heroes, and this is actually full of artistic heroes. We've got Dai Satsumi coming to Seattle, Robert Kondo coming to Seattle, Terrell Whitlatch, who is by all ex-、uh, you know many consider I consider her the best creature designer out there, and guess what I. I do character creature designs, and I'm saying that she is the best.、Uh, then there is Mike Yamada, who is production designer at Disney. So production designer is like higher than art director.、Uh, they control. They come up with the look of the whole film. And、uh, oh, and of course, I'm going there as well. So I'll be teaching painting creatures. Tara will be teaching creature anatomy. So that's going to be really great. That's Seattle, April seventh and eighth. London, April sixteenth, seventeenth. That's Sam Nielsen, Nathan Fox, Carla Ortiz, Wes Burt, Jeff Turley, Christophe Lautret. So you know, that's another huge one. You guys know most of those people, and of course Carla Ortiz. She's working on Doctor Strange for Marvel right now. Wesper is working on another hot big ticket movie that I can't tell you right now. And Jeff Turley, of course, he came up with the look of picture of,、uh, or he is responsible for much of the look of picture for Feast, for、uh, Paper Man. And as well as he's worked on a slew of movies,、uh, mentioned in the Oscars, that kind of level. You know, Christophe Lautret started at DreamWorks on Prince of Egypt, I believe. So you know, he goes way back.、Uh, both those people are gonna, or all those people, sorry, are gonna be in London, 
April 16th, 17th, and Berlin, April 23rd, 24th. However, Berlin's already sold out. Mm -hmm. So if you're even thinking about it, I'm telling you, just just go one time or look up uh, people that have gone in the past and see what they say. Mm -hmm. I believe that's it. That's that's a lot. (laughs) I went on for a while. Lots of great workshops. Um, so Tiffany asks, I live in a small town. What is the best way to get noticed and sell work outside of the town? Well, best way would be, would be to travel mm-hmm. uh, to places. I generally will you know, put aside a good amount. Um, this is how I started, right? You put aside an amount to just go somewhere every year. It's an investment. Right, and if you think about it like that, then when you go, you're going to be much more active. You're going to try to approach many more people and uh, make the best out of your time. Uh, the combination, of course, is the best. So the combination would be to go to workshops and conventions where professionals are. Uh, number two would be to be very persistent and consistent with your uh social media you know posting at the same time you know every week or whatever it is you know once a month if it's once a month you know but to be as consistent as you can now this one i have definitely i go through my periods where i'll drop off and then i'll come back on but that's just because i got a lot of stuff to do if you if uh those of you that are just starting off you generally will have much more time than me, so stay consistent, right? Make it a priority. Um, the thing about the traveling, though, is that if you are going to approach people, you're going to talk with people, then you're going to have a much... Uh, the trip will be much more worth it for you. And a lot of times, it will come back to you many-fold over. Uh, not right away because I am more well sometimes right away but I am more about the slow play right the the bigger uh, goals the bigger plans so it's not like an instant oh I go there and then I'm gonna be in movies Uh, sometimes it's you go there a few times Mm -hmm. Um, the last one is to get into annuals and things like that where there is a jury there's a jury that picks the people that get accepted Um, if you do all of those then then that's you know that's what I would suggest that's what uh, I know has given us our first bunch of breaks as well as uh, continues to give us those breaks so even if you aren't starting off those are all those three are very important Mm -hmm. Um, so Stefano asks hey Bobby I'm finishing your beautiful digital painting course now I'm very attracted by Dyson Kondo's uh, course but maybe go first to your but maybe go first to your painting creatures is uh, most is the most logical path. What do you suggest? It really depends on uh, what you want to do, uh, what you want to concentrate on. Of course, if you want to do um, creatures, then of course that one would be the logical choice. Mm-hmm. However, I am such a fan of all the other teachers on schoolism. I would naturally, I would just say, yeah. Robert Kondo, Daisy Sumi, <laughs> that's an awesome one. And, but yeah, if you said, you know, which one should I take first, Jason Seiler or my course, I would probably be like, yeah, Jason Seiler. <laughs> that one's awesome, which I totally 100% feel like it is awesome. The people that come out of those courses are totally changed, uh, noticeably changed, evolved, uh, which is incredible to see. Mm-hmm. Which courses uh, would you recommend, Nase? You've taken a bunch. Hmm. Well, you know, I'm not gonna lie. I'm 
your classes are pretty good so far. I'm taking the self-taught ones. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, I, I'm just taking um, Daniel Ariaga's uh, character design class, and that's it's going really well so far. And that's with feedback or without? Yeah, with feedback, with the critique. Um, and also, starting today, I'm going to be start, uh, doing uh, Jonathan Hardesty's Ooh, nice. Yeah. Essentials of realism. Mm -hmm. And it's back to fundamentals for me. <laughs> so yeah. I'm really excited for that. Me too. You know, it's this year is all about fundamentals for me as well. Like uh, like I said, I, I'm getting my art critique by the grand master, Craig Mullins. Yeah. Holy smokes. He gave me homework. Uh, I'm going to do it. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's really cool. Yeah, back to being a student. <laughs> yeah, because his, his course is really, really cool because um, you're talking with them live, right? Mm. And that's like for like an hour or something. It's just you and him uh, and multiple times, which I thought was just amazing. Yeah. And, you know, I, I've done so many classes, but, like, doing the meetup yesterday just to test out everything and for him to just run through everything as if I was his student, which I consider myself to be his student, you know? Like, he was doing paint overs, explaining things. I asked him questions. It was so cool. Uh, very, very unique experience. That one is going to be insane to get into. It's only two He's only taking two people per month. Oh my gosh. You know, so what a what a bunch of lucky bunch of people that got into his course. Yeah. That's super exciting. Okay, uh so Anita asks, Hi Bobby, I'm planning on getting a table at the Luca convention. Oh is right that on. super difficult for someone with an established name? Uh, oh, sorry, without an established name. You know what? I'm not sure. I've never been to Luca Festival, but we want to go. We want to go this year, actually, in November, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, Angoulême, we couldn't go to Angoulême because we were in Montreal, but not only that, but uh, we are going to L.A. Uh, shortly after, like in a few days, for the Annie Awards. So it was a little too close, so uh, we couldn't go to Angoulême. But we want to replace it with uh, Luca Festival and see that one because we've never been and we've always heard really, really wonderful things about the Luca Festival. So I don't know how to sign up. Um, and I don't know how it is to sign up. So I'm sorry, I, I can't really help you with that one. But if anybody does know, perhaps put it in the comments mm -hmm. and uh, help our friend out here. All right. I feel like it would still be... You know, it's still good to get a table there because um, when I went to Fan Expo in Toronto uh, for my first time, I didn't know anyone or I didn't know what to do. But there were just so many great artists that are, you know, sitting beside you and they talk to you and everyone's generally nice. So I feel like, you know, just take a hit of it at, at, at it. So you never know. Yeah. Was that your first time having a table? Um, two years ago was my first time having a table. Wow. Yeah. So you were doing the convention thing before you got into college? Um, oh, no, no. Actually, I did it in first year of college. Oh, yeah. the summer. The, the summer, summer yeah, summertime. You... Wow, that's still awesome. I didn't start doing conventions until, like, I finished, uh, you know, animation, and then I mm -hmm. finished computer animation, mm -hmm. and then I... And it wasn't even on purpose. A friend of mine had a had a table with nothing to sell because he, he didn't prepare. Yeah. So I was just like, I, I put out this new book uh -huh. that I had no idea how I'm going to sell the book. And so I was like, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll take your table. <laughs> yeah. And that started the whole convention thing. Yeah. And like, yeah. you know, a lot of people, It's I think it's a great way to just network. And there's no, there's really nothing to be scared of. Definitely. So many, like, you know, a lot of times people will ask, well, how did you meet this person? How did you meet this person? Half the time it's from workshops or conventions. Mm -hmm. 
All right, we're almost out of time. So, okay. uh, how many more? Um, we'll just shoot through all these okay. uh, questions quickly. Um, I'd love to get to one of your schoolism workshops, but it's not too practical for me to go out of the U.S. right now. Are you going to do anything like that in America? Uh, yes. So Seattle, April seventh and eighth. I think that one's a hot, hot ticket. Mm -hmm. uh, not only that, but it's on the same weekend. It, it's shared. We're doing it with the Emerald City Comic Con, right? So you can go to both and maximize your traveling dollars. Right? You could go to the workshop as well as to Comic Con. Mm -hmm. Highly recommended. Like I said, that one is Marcelo Vignali, Dai Satsumi, Robert Kondo, Terrell Whitlatch, Mike Yamada, and myself. Uh, you know, so besides me, there's some killer artists. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, so Kendra asks, could you maybe also approach Grizz and Norm for an interview? Their yes. Tuesday tips are awesome. Yes. Agreed. Agreed. Double agreed. Uh, Fun fact, Norm went to Sheridan College. Yeah. He, uh, I think he was, he graduated a year after me or something like that, but I think perhaps we're the same age. Uh, phenomenal artists, mm -hmm. plural. Um, yeah, great power couple. Mm -hmm. I should totally do that. Yeah, our, my, when I was in Sheridan, our life drawing teacher still had a piece of his life drawing and oh, I'm yeah. like he's amazing <laughs> he draws really bloody fast he's a story artist at uh, Disney if you guys didn't know yeah great artist um, Fernando asks when are you guys coming back to Austin Austin I'm not sure <laughs> <laughs> hopefully again sometimes yeah too. I would yeah. love to I never went to the Austin one so um yeah, I'm not too sure, but no plans yet, but that doesn't mean that we're never going back, you know? Mm -hmm. um, Sagittarius A star asks, Hey Bobby, do you think you'll ever do a schoolism workshop in Phoenix? That Phoenix, awesome. Arizona. Um, hey, never say never, but no plans thus far. Mm -hmm. um, Mark's everywhere Ask, uh, Hey Bobby, how have you maintained your momentum? Um, just, you know, having good goals, things that I'm excited about, I think. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, this morning, I set my alarm at 5, I woke up at 4.30, you know, I was just like, up, and I was like, oh, I want to, you know, get to the studio and work on my little, um, Montreal trip, uh, video. Yeah. <laughs> as yeah. long as you have something to look forward, then, you know, you'll be all, like, worked up and prepped for it. Yeah, exactly. You know, you can definitely tell uh, if you're in the right environment if days go by really, really quick. Mm -hmm. um, Frida asks, uh, what classes are great for fundamentals? Well, of course, there's drawing fundamentals with uh, Thomas Fleurity. That one's fantastic. Uh, if you really struggle with lighting, understanding light and color uh, Sam Nielsen has the perfect class because it's called fundamentals of uh, lighting with Sam Nielsen Steven Silver does uh, fundamentals of character design um, Jason Seiler's you know even though it's, it says the art of character it's actually really great for beginners uh, to have huge growth by the time they finish, mm -hmm. as well as professionals, of mm -hmm. course. Um, Dice and Roberts class, highly recommended as well. Uh, I'm not sure. That might be a, a more advanced. of a struggle. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a bit advanced. Fantastic um, course. Mm -hmm. um, I teach digital painting techniques, and uh, a lot of beginners have taken that course and and uh, got more than they expected out of it. Um, Andrew's class? Andrew's class, yes. Yeah. Introduction to Digital Painting. 
uh, wonderful, phenomenal uh, illustrator living in South Korea right now. Uh, yeah, that one's great too. And the great thing is, is that we do we do our paintings and illustrations totally differently. Same with pretty much every teacher on there, you know. So that, like I, like I was saying with Craig Mullins, you know, learning anatomy, drawing the same muscles from different people. This is Craig Mullins we're talking about, you know. So like, highly recommend that you don't just study one artist. You don't just learn one subject from one artist, but you explore that subject with various artists. And that's how schoolism is designed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Lots of great classes. And uh, John's class would also be good. John well. Hardesty. Yeah. Can't say enough about this man. He's phenomenal. Uh, essentials of realism. Thanks, Miss A. No problem. So the next question is, Frida asks, will there be a schoolism workshop in Singapore? Working on it. We worked on it, but um, it's difficult because Singapore is so small. So venue spaces are like crazy expensive. Plus we're traveling from North America. So and plane mm -hmm. tickets are very expensive as well. Um, but hey, don't be surprised if we end up knocking on your door. <laughs> Singapore would be great. Yeah, spicy crab. That is worth the ticket itself. Have you been to Singapore? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, a few years ago. Man, we went. I still am waiting to go <laughs> one day. Uh, if you like spicy food and seafood, that is the spot. Oh, best combination ever. Yes. Wow. Okay, so we have a few more questions. Um, Teresa asks, uh, will current or future schoolism classes be available to stream via iPad? Yes, uh, so we are working on that and we're actually working on the new version of schoolism uh, that will come out probably this fall, hopefully before. Mm -hmm. um, and it's gonna have all sorts of really great things that we've been thinking about to help the art community as well like even further so very exciting and part of that is going to be of course being able to watch everything on ipad and stuff like that uh it is uh it is going to be a huge improvement so you know it's going to take a bit of time mm -hmm. Um, okay, so the last question is actually towards me. Um, right on. Mase, it's cool to have both of you these days in the stream. It's more interesting. You seem like a good person. Oh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> how does it feel to work with all the team at Imaginism? It's, I don't know what to say. It's awesome. It's more than I asked for. Honestly, it's the best studio, well, Yay. <laughs> that I've worked in and I, yeah, I can't say anything more than I love it here. Oh. We love you too, Mase. Oh, Yay. thanks, Kate. <laughs> yeah, it's been really great having you here. And uh, it's really great taking you to places and watching, just like watching your expression, just like, you know, being happy and stuff. And we're just like, oh, yeah, I remember the mm -hmm. first time we went to, you know, CTN or something like that. Yeah. It's great. <laughs> we kind of relive it through you. Oh, thanks. Oops, I missed the question. Sorry. Uh, Sheila asks, um, Hey, Bobby, any update on Ian McKaig's upcoming class? Yes, so uh, he says it's due out in the summer. So it's going to be a while, but it's going to be mega worth it. Mm -hmm. Yep, I think that's all the questions that we have. Wonderful. Well, thank you everybody that tuned in today on such short notice. It was really great just sketching with you guys and, uh, you know, taking the questions and, and hang out with uh, my wonderful friend Masay here. Yeah. Thanks okay. for having me. Oh, anytime. Thank you for coming out. So thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Masay, for, you know, uh, co-piloting this uh, stream with me. And everybody have a great, wonderful Monday. Take care, everybody.
Hi, this is Steven Silver, and I've been a professional artist and character designer for over 20 years. I have developed such characters as Kim Possible, Danny Phantom, Clerks the Animated Series, and many others. In Advanced Character Design with Steven Silver, I will show you my personal techniques for designing in different styles, creating appealing women, kids, and animal characters, designing from storyboards, and much more. In this class, you will learn the skills and outlook that will make you a valuable studio designer and a design team asset. This class is made up of nine lecture videos, each with an accompanying assignment. With each assignment that you submit on time, you will receive a personalized feedback video from me in which I will draw over your work and talk about what you did well, what you can work on, and how you can improve your designs. I will also answer any questions or comments that you may have. The full lesson plan for advanced character design is available on schoolism.com. This course is intended for artists with character design experience. If you are not sure if you are ready to take this class, please send us your online portfolio and one of our staff will be happy to give you a fair and honest recommendation. All of my lectures and feedback videos are pre-recorded, so you will be able to access them conveniently no matter where in the world you live. Each student will receive my personal attention, so space is limited. Register today. Thank you and I look forward to having you in my class.